This is St. Louis on the Air from St. Louis Public Radio. I'm Elaine Cha. It's got that nutty kind of butteriness, but it almost finishes with a little, like, fruit flavor. Like that salty kind of brininess. We do the traditional uh, accoutrements of shallot, egg, caper, and creme fraiche. They are sourcing their uh, caviar from Quincy, Illinois. Paired with Johnny Cakes, Mm -hmm. which traditionally is blinis, but we do Johnny Cakes. Okay. Since we're a little more Southern. And what is a Johnny Cake? It is a cornmeal pancake. Okay, delicious. (laughs) When you think of caviar, maybe you think of black hats and white gloves the first class section of a plane, or a private dining room in a fancy hotel. But caviar has some strong associations here in the St. Louis region, and you don't need to join a country club or own a yacht to enjoy it. The delicacy, made of fish eggs called roe, aren't just served in local restaurants. Caviar is harvested here, right on the Mississippi. We're harvesting with nets, and and whenever we first started harvesting, uh, you know, back years ago, there weren't hardly any regulations, and uh, you know, since then, uh, we, I mean, we've got a sustainable product now. Uh, here in Illinois, you know, we fish Mississippi River, uh, Illinois, Missouri, kind of a combined type deal. We've got a length limit, which is a 24 inch, 32 inch slot that they have to be in, which this allows the sturgeon to actually spawn twice before we can even harvest the fish, every part of the fish gets used. All of our meat either goes to Georgia or goes into uh, Chicago, uh, smokers. The, the, the meat is almost as well liked as what the caviar is on the, you know, on the sturgeon or spoonbill, either one. That's Cliff Rost. He's been in the caviar business for more than 20 years. His product may be considered a luxury, but it is hard work. Mother Nature is our biggest enemy. I mean, you, you run through the winter when it's cold, the wind's blowing, it's ornery. I mean, we just, you, you fish all of the time. As far as the, the process goes, um, Kara pretty much takes care of 95% of the process. And Kara is Cliff's wife. Together, Clara and Cliff Rost run Show Me Caviar in Pleasant Hill, Illinois. That's about a two-hour drive north of St. Louis, right near the Mississippi. Kara says she married into the caviar business, and she gets why people might be hesitant to give these eggs a try. Well, people have their their idea, and a lot of people are very visual, so they're picturing what they think caviar looks like and what it is, so it makes them a little bit skeptical. Um, we've been at a state fair before and given out samples, and I mean, a funny way to put it, I guess, is that a lot of the parents use their kids as guinea pigs. <laughs> they, 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 their, their child would try it, and they'd watch for the look on the face, and the child would be like, hmm, it's pretty good. So then the parents would try it, try it and they're like, oh, yeah, yeah that, is, that is pretty good. That was Kara Rost. She and her husband Cliff own Show Me Caviar. They spoke yesterday with St. Louis on the Air producer Danny Wisentowski. Now, as you heard... Caviar has a way of making converts, even for those who never thought of themselves as people of, quote, champagne wishes and caviar dreams. And one of those people is Mira Nagarajan. She chronicled her journey into the world of caviar in this month's issue of Sauce magazine. Mira, welcome back to the show. Thank you. So your experience with caviar going into this for research for this piece? I mean, what was your experience like? I was, I would say my experience was very limited. I think that I, I don't really remember ordering caviar ever really before this story. And I saw it as something that was expensive and maybe I didn't want to uh, spend the majority of a check on it. So I didn't always order it. Mm -hmm. Um, But for this, I definitely did indulge, and I had a great time. Mm -hmm. And was your not trying it primarily associated with some of the, you know, the things that we might think about when it comes to caviar sort of as this luxury good? I think it was just I would maybe get a little sticker shock from it. And if I wasn't sure that I was going to enjoy it, I didn't know, I didn't feel confident in ordering it. Mm-hmm. 
So I'd like to add another voice to this conversation. John Messbarger is executive chef at Peacemaker Lobster and Crab in St. Louis. John, welcome to the show. Thank you. So how is it that you were first introduced to caviar? So I don't remember the real first time I had it, uh, but definitely throughout the restaurants that I worked at, uh, trying different types, slowly getting more experience with it. And then once Peacemaker got going with our theme of being so seafood oriented, uh, we would run it on New Year specials and things like that. And then we hit a point where we're like, well, this is pretty popular on holidays. Let's go ahead and try and see how it goes regular menu. Mm-hmm. So we started bringing in more types, trying it, figuring out items, and it kind of took off and became popular. Then the pandemic hit and we stopped for a while. Mm-hmm. The pandemic stopped a lot of things. Yeah, and then it came <laughs> back recently now. And right. It seems very popular yeah. currently. So, Mira, John was mentioning occasions on which Peacemaker would uh, would offer caviar. But your own experience with this, you know, you took sort of a, a culinary journey that did not start with a, a holiday, as far as I understand. And you tried different kinds of caviar. So what was the the first dish maybe that you tried and did it surprise you? I it did surprise me. It was at Bistro La Florissan. It was there uh, they did a special I think or had a menu item. It was a waffle with creme fraiche and then their golden kaluga caviar which is on a different menu item at the, at this point. But I was surprised. I loved that it had this like n- hazelnutty kind of uh, rich richness to it. And um, I began to understand why people enjoy it so much. And what I liked about that dish, especially for me, was that I was there with three other people. So we split it and it didn't feel like such a big ask in terms of cost. So uh, it was a great introduction and um, I loved it. Mm -hmm. Another place you had caviar was at Sado. Uh, it's a sushi restaurant in St. Louis. Nick Bognar was actually on our show not too long ago. What is it that stood out about the the caviar that you had at that restaurant? Well, that is their Ocetra caviar, which is um, it is got like it's a more, comes from a more mature fish, and so it's got this really beautiful pop texture to it. It's got this um, brininess to it, but it's also very buttery and rich, um, and. I think what was interesting about that particular dish, it's the gunkan nigiri, which is um, it's seaweed, it's seasoned sushi rice, the chopped up toro tartar. Toro is um, tuna belly. Tuna, right. So it's very, very velvety and it has a richness to it. But the fish is unseasoned. So they add the Ocetra caviar, which has salty umami kind of uh, flavor profile to it to season the fish. And the way he described that dish, which was so appealing to me, was it's something akin to sourdough bread with a nice smear of uh, French butter. Okay. <laughs> Because, you know, the rice has the vinegar and then um, the, the, the tuna and the caviar together work to add this very rich kind of decadent uh, topping mm-hmm. to it. So, John, one of the perks of this job is to get to sample things that sometimes people bring in. And you brought some caviar, that, yes. which I got to try. And Cliff Ross earlier in our show had described the taste of caviar as kind of, you know, buttery and nutty in flavor. And that's something that Mira has also talked about. But the the caviar that you gave to me, can you tell those who are listening what it is that you brought and how you would describe the flavor profile of what you shared? So the caviar we brought today was uh, an Ocetra from uh, North Carolina. Uh, it is farmed, and uh, it's the only Ocetra, which when we speak of Ocetra, that's a breed of sturgeon. There's there's around 30 breeds of sturgeon, mm-hmm. and not all are used for caviar, but I believe that most are. Okay. Um, but so that breed, and that's the only American breed farm-raised in uh, the U.S., and it's a really nice caviar. It's not over-the-top expensive, um, but that one, it... It's got that nutty kind of butteriness, but it almost finishes with a little, like, 
fruit flavor. That's exactly, a, yeah. Almost like a, a light stone fruit uh, taste, which people think that don't think of that when you hear it with seafood, but it's actually a very common flavor with oysters, caviar, like finishing with fruits or apricots or mm-hmm. some say like Chardonnay grapes. And I tried it probably about um, 25 minutes ago. I almost had a sip of coffee, but I like want to continue to sort of <laughs> work through what the, the flavor of this is. And it wasn't a, a big scoop. There's an adorable little spoon that we used. Um, but when it is, when these kinds of caviar are served at Peacemaker, are there things that you are pairing it with such that people can really enjoy not just the flavor, but the texture? Yes. So that's the cool thing about caviar is it's a, a texture and flavor. Different different breeds, different ages of fish cause different uh, textures of the eggs, like if the eggs are firm or soft. And it's not necessarily bad or good if they're firmer or softer because sometimes you want – it's interesting when you get the softer eggs where it's all one bite of creaminess as opposed to the individual pops of the larger, firmer eggs. But we try and um, – So right now on the menu, we pair them with a – we have a deviled egg, which goes very well with that. Mm -hmm. We do the traditional uh, accoutrements of shallot, egg, um, caper, and creme fraiche paired with Johnny Cakes, Mm -hmm. which traditionally is blinis, but we do Johnny Cakes since we're a little more southern. And what is a Johnny Cake? It is a cornmeal pancake. Okay, delicious. (laughs) And then we do the sampler, and I always like to tell people when they get the sampler to try – each type individually a little first Mm -hmm. and then eat it with the shallots and eggs and capers and enjoy it with the the little flavor pairings. Right. But it's always nice to get a little taste of them plain first. Mm -hmm. So caviar, it it can be used then as a kind of seasoning, which is, I guess, the, the way that you experienced it, Mira, at Sado. So it's not necessarily the star of the show. Is that also an approach that is taken up at the cocktail lounge, none of the above? There, caviar is offered as an additional upgrade to onion dip. So how does caviar fare as an upgrade? And in this case, too, is it really used sort of as an additional seasoning or a a textural sort of delight? (laughs) I would say uh, if you're really concentrating and you get a big scoop of caviar with the dip, it could play a textural role. I think the one that I tried um, had a creamier texture. It didn't have like a firm firmness to it. But the onion dip at None of the Above, which is one of my favorite things in town, it's very, very decadent and very creamy. So what I found the caviar to do was introduce like that salty kind of brininess Mm -hmm. to kind of chill out this very, very decadent, rich onion dip and then with the potato chips it just the potato chips really added the textural element in that experience okay. but it added a really great salt briny kind of bomb to it mm-hmm. and you also took a trip to Maplewood to visit the Benevolent King that is a, a Japanese restaurant I should clarify no monarchy mm-hmm. in Maplewood that we know of but if there were a king would would he, she, they be chowing down on caviar? I mean, what is it that um, that is done with caviar there that sets it apart maybe from other places? Well, I believe that they are sourcing from Show Me State caviar. Um, they, he, I do know that they are sourcing their uh, caviar from Quincy, Illinois, for uh, Ben Paremba's private label. It's called, uh, I think it's called, it's a private label caviar that he sells at his Um, retail and also serves in restaurants. So at Benevolent King, they do uh, a lobster, a a roll called the King Roll with lobster, cucumber, avocado. There's a torched Hokkaido scallop in there, a truffle aioli with uh, yuzu and then also the caviar. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's playing more of a flavor profile role again here because that particular caviar from the Show Me State people has a light brininess, like a more creamy texture to it. 
um, a very like kind of simpler flavor profile. It's not as it's not going to be as complex as the Ocetra you tried today. Um, but they also use it atop raw oysters, and then they also use it uh, with rice crackers. So you can really just experience the flavor of it of the caviar alone. So we're going to continue this conversation uh, in just a moment, but we have a recap of our breaking news. We were off the air for our broadcast stream for a couple minutes at the top of our show. Now, we had heard from STLPR reporter Kate Grumke, who joined us from just outside Nashville, Illinois, to give us an update on flash flooding. About 300 residents of the community, about 55 miles southeast of St. Louis, have been evacuated, and they're being asked to seek shelter at the Trinity Lutheran Church. Interstate 64 near Nashville is closed in both directions, and in Missouri, portions of the I-270 are closed in North St. Louis County, off uh, ramps, that is, onto I-70 in O'Fallon, Missouri, are also closed. Uh, So, Mira, we were just talking before um, that news break about the Benevolent King restaurant and its caviar Um, It is served at the Benevolent King with sushi. What is that combination like again? That one, I think because of the type of caviar that they're using from Show Me Caviar, it's a very, it's got a light brininess to it. So it's not a very like, it's not very intensely salty. Mm -hmm. It's also coming, I believe, from a younger fish. So it's not as like texturally pop. It's got more of a creamy finish to it. So I think what it's adding is just a little bit of umami, a little bit of salt, a little bit of like this delicate brine. Mm -hmm. Now, John, you are not only a chef, you eat yourself. And in your experience with the types of fish and caviar, how does the type of fish affect what we taste and specifically like sturgeon and paddlefish? So one of the main things with uh, the differences when you're talking about fish, especially when you get into the word caviar, most of the world has rules. America does not. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Uh, Where it caviar only comes from the sturgeon. In America, you can call trout row trout caviar if you want Mm -hmm. and not get in trouble for labeling. Yeah. Other parts of the world, you cannot do that. Okay. But – so basically what you get into with those is especially the when we talk about paddlefish and sturgeon they're they're very closely related mm-hmm. they're both ancient dinosaur species <laughs> and they both a- take forever to age to produce eggs uh but the paddlefish eggs will be um just because of the type of fish they're a softer egg that's what the fish produces a sturgeon egg is going to be more firm so we get in a paddlefish row uh, it's going to be more of what we described as that creamy uh, one bite and as opposed to when you get into the sturgeon, it's more of you feel the individual pop of eggs. Mm-hmm. And that also depends on with sturgeon, age of the fish, um, also size of the eggs, right. which comes with breeds. When we talk about um, the hackleback sturgeon, which is the local sturgeon, uh, it's the smallest breed of sturgeon. So they have the smallest eggs. Mm-hmm. So. Are you finding that there's more demand for caviar? I mean, are customers and chefs, like they're, are they talking about it both at the restaurant and outside in, in like chef spaces? It does seem – so It's it just seems like it's more readily available. Um, the, the crazy thing with caviar is it's a market almost like any other stocks where it's up and down. Mm. And right now the prices aren't insanely crazy. So it's more approachable, more restaurants can have it rather than worry about, oh, I have to bring in this extremely expensive product, and if I don't sell it, I'm stuck with it. Right. So with it being slightly more approachable, um, especially with, I think, with some of the farming, I think, has helped. Right, uh, right. Because it got pretty unsustainable for a while with wild sturgeon. So now I think it's become a little more approachable, and that. You can put it on your menu without charging so much that people look at it and be like, I'm going to spend more on this half ounce of fish eggs than I will on an entire meal. Right. 
So this, it sounds like it's a good time to try it. Yes. Yeah. So Mira, in speaking with several chefs and restaurant owners who are using caviar, what are they telling you about this moment? I mean, can we expect to see caviar in more places? Yes, I think so. I think that what John was saying is really interesting because what I learned from chefs that I spoke to was that a lot of their customers that are curious about it tend to be a little bit younger, whereas maybe 20 years ago, the client base who was interested in caviar might have been more mature or you know more established. And uh, some people think maybe it's because of TikTok, maybe it's because of Instagram and seeing how other people are interacting with this, this particular item, and they have a curiosity about it. So mm-hmm. I did take note of that and thought that was very illuminating. Mm-hmm. Mira Nagarajan is a food writer in St. Louis. Her recent piece in Sauce Magazine's July issue explores the rising popularity of caviar. And I should note, Mira recently finished her four-year run as executive editor of Sauce Magazine, but you will still find her work there and other places around town. Jeff uh, John Messbarger is executive chef at Peacemaker Lobster and Crab in St. Louis. John, thank you. And Mira, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks. This episode was produced by Danny Wissentowski. Audio engineering and podcast design by Aaron Dore. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thank you. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. The Gateway brings you the day's news each weekday from around the St. Louis region and the state capitals in Jefferson City. Our schools are accredited. We don't need this bill. And Springfield. How many more years must pass before lawmakers see time is of the essence? I'm Abby Larico. Join me each weekday for The Gateway on the STLPR app or wherever you get podcasts.